So hello everyone. Um, welcome uh, to tonight's lecture uh, arranged by the Center for Asian and Middle Eastern uh, Studies in partnership with Usul Academy. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Ahmed Shraib. Uh, tonight we are to have the seventh and the final lecture in the series, Decolonizing Social Sciences from Uniplexity to Multiplexity. Now, title of tonight's lecture is a very fascinating, Multiplex Ethics and Human Rights. I'm looking really forward to this. Our lecturer is our distinguished professor, Rajab Shantur, who doesn't really need much introduction and he's probably getting sick of me introducing him every time like this, but I have to tell you because it is not something, yeah, no mean feat. So Professor Shenturk is a professor of sociology at Ibn Khaldun University in Turkey. He served as the, found, as the founding president of Ibn Khaldun University from 2017 to 2021. He was a researcher at the Center for Islamic Studies in Istanbul and founding director of the Alliance of Civilizations Institute. He is the head of the International Ibn Khaldun Society, and he has published widely in English, Arabic, and Turkish on a whole range of topics, including social theory and methods, civilization, modernization, sociology of religion, networks of hadith transmission, and Malcolm X, Islam and human rights, modern Turkish thought, and Ibn Khaldun. He also has authored several books that have been translated into Arabic, Japanese, and Spanish. So that is our introduction to our lecturer today. Um, with regards to the actual session tonight, uh, just very uh, simply, I have some ground rules, house rules that I'd like to remind our audience. Um, I'd like to ask you to keep um, the, your microphone and the mobile on mute until uh, I sort of advise you otherwise. We definitely encourage questions and discussions, but please do uh, remember to maintain a professional uh, approach and a decorum within the environment. We also encourage our attendees and participants to take notes of the lecture, uh, for, and especially for the comments and questions. These are quite heavy duty lectures with a lot of ideas going on, so it'd be worth you having a pen and paper at hand to make your notes. Um, so really, I don't want to spend more time. We will be having the session for about 30 to 45 minutes, and then I will open up the uh, our group for discussions and questions. Um, so, uh, inshallah, we'll, we'll take it from there. I, without further ado, Professor Shento, please hey, do uh, deliver your lecture. Thank you. Assalamu yes. alaikum, uh, everyone. Uh, my greetings and best wishes uh, to all of you from different parts uh, of the world. Uh, today, I will be talking to you about uh, multiplex ethics and uh, human rights. Uh, this will be the last uh, lecture in a seven uh, lecture uh, series about decolonizing social sciences from uniplexity to uh, multiplexity. Until now, I have been talking about uh, theoretical uh, aspects, uh, but uh, in this uh, last uh, lecture, I will be talking about uh, practical implications of uh, multiplexity vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uniplexity, uh, especially in the field of uh, ethics, which is about uh, relations of human beings with uh, each other, as well as with the uh, animal kingdom and uh, nature. And uh, uh, one of the concrete areas where uh, uh, ethics is uh, manifested is the area of uh, human rights. I will, be, I will touch uh, on this issue uh, uh, before I conclude this uh, lecture. Uh, before I start the lecture, I would like to uh, tell you about the tree, you know, uh, you see here. So this is a, a tree of Futuwe, Shajaratul Futuwe. Futuwe means uh, uh, youth ethics uh, derived from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. And one of the Ottoman uh, authors uh, drew it as a tree. Uh, and each leaf uh, represents one uh, ethical virtue. Uh, in that uh, uh, tree, and it's called Shajaratul uh, Futuwa. Uh, so, uh, why should we care about uh, ethics? Uh, we all know that uh, human life is all about making choices. We do many uh, choices, but uh, uh, rarely we think about why you know we make all these uh, decisions. Uh, so we as human beings acquire huge amount of information about the world around us throughout our lives from a variety of sources, 
from science, from personal experience, from culture, from religion, and uh, etc. Most of the time, we accept these eyes, these ideas, without uh, questioning them, without critically uh, analyzing them. Uh, so, awareness about ethics uh, makes us, uh, 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 you know, critically analyze these ideas we receive uh, either from science or from society and act upon them. Uh, so briefly, we can say that ethics uh, uh, allows us to live an authentic life, a critically analyzed life, a self-reflexive life. Uh, through the study of ethics, we are invited to examine critically our own and others' arguments about some fundamental issues. For instance, what ought uh, we, uh, we to live? What is justice? You know, how should society be organized? How should economy, politics be organized? What's right and wrong? Uh, so briefly put, what's the right thing to do? You know, that's the uh, question uh, ethics uh, tries to uh, answer. Uh, so there are many indispensable questions in our life. Uh, for instance, uh, is it wrong to kill animals for scientific inquiry? So this is an ethical question. Do we have the right to kill in self-defense? Is euthanasia wrong? Is it acceptable to risk the lives of people for recommencing economic activity? You know, this is the uh, question we face during the uh, pandemic, the lockdown. You know, uh, uh, should we be willing to accept the surveillance of the state to enforce social distancing? So our everyday notions of right and wrong are not enough to answer these complicated uh, questions. Uh, we need a deeper understanding of uh, ethics to address these kind of uh, complicated uh, questions. Uh, uh, we need theoretical frameworks that can help us analyze complex problems and to find rational, coherent solutions to those problems. But uh, there are many theoretical frameworks you know, in ethics. So which one we are going to use? Uh, uh, so what will be the standard according to which we judge good and bad actions in this normative uncertainty. Uh, and people have like different standards, different criterion to judge. Uh, so which one we are going to adopt? Uh, uh, so ethics may be defined as knowing and doing the right thing. Uh, and uh, traditionally, it's called hikmet, hikmet you know, uh, in uh, Arabic, Turkish, Persian. Uh, ethics is about knowing and doing the right thing. Ethics is the contact of a good human life in association with other entities, human and non-human. Ethically good life calls for a reflective attitude by individual humans towards their particular ideas of the good in which reflection is guided by a concern for ethical truth. Uh, traditionally, philosophers such as Aristotle, Ibn Sina, and Kanalazade talked about three major domains where human beings are held responsible and need to do the right thing. Their cells, the individual life, their families, the family life, and the cities, the city life. Uh, knowing and doing the right thing about these three domains is called practical philosophy, al hikma al uh, amaliya uh, traditionally. And al hikma al amaliya is a discipline uh, uh, is a traditional uh, discipline in Islamic intellectual uh, history. And there are many works uh, on al hikma al amiyya produced by uh, many scholars. Uh, in our world, the implications of human behavior extend well beyond the individual to impact the environment, other animals, and the whole life of human uh, society. So our relationship is not limited only to other uh, human beings. Uh, uh, so Knarazade, uh, one of the greatest Ottoman uh, philosophers of uh, practical uh, philosophy, so he classified philosophy into uh, two branches. Uh, actually, this classification is uh, borrowed from Aristotle and maintained by Muslim philosophers uh, as well. So there is theoretical philosophy and practical uh, philosophy. And uh, theoretical philosophy studies metaphysics, mathematics, and natural sciences. And practical philosophy, which is called al hikma al amaliya So theoretical philosophy is called al hikma al nazariya 
and practical philosophy is called al hikma al amaliya because it's about amal practice uh, so it involves uh, uh, management of self management of the household and management of society so in arabic tadbir al nafs which means management of the self and tadbir al manzil management of the household and tadbir al madina which means management of uh, society so there are three levels of uh, ethics there are three levels of uh, morality uh, self family and city uh, so tadbir al nafs uh, is uh, today called ethics and tedbir al manzil is today called economics and tedbir al medina uh, management city is called uh, politics uh, uh, as i have mentioned there are you know different stands different approaches different standards in the field of uh, ethics uh, so uh, there is moral objectivism moral relativism and multiplex uh, ethics uh, moral object objectivism is the view that uh, there are objective universal and moral uh, universal moral principles that are valid for everyone so ethical principles uh, they are uh, universal and applicable to everyone so this is called moral objectivism and then moral relativism which emerged in reaction uh, to moral objectivism uh, and it's usually called uh, like postmodernist uh, uh, view on ethics uh, holds that there is no absolute ethical truth independent of human beings uh, so it's uh, uh, ethical truth is uh, uh, based on human uh, decisions uh, very individualistic uh, that's why it is uh, relativist uh, moral objectivism is unable to appreciate the context while moral relativism fails to account for the agreement between different societies about what's morally right uh, so these are two extremes uh, multiplex ethics however recognizes both objective and subjective levels in ethical reasoning uh, and at the same time both relative and universal uh, dimensions of ethical reasoning uh, so uh, multiplexity brings the insights from both uh, 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 reductionist uh, perspectives in a holistic and comprehensive uh, perspective and i i will explain how it does so uh, <clears throat> uh, what's the nature of good and evil husun and uh, kubu and this is how it's called in our uh, uh, intellectual tradition uh, good and bad and it is discussed in uh, ilm al kalam and uh, fiqh uh, so there are two positions uh, regarding the nature of good and evil uh, whether uh, it's whether uh, there is absolute good and uh, uh, evil or it's relative to uh, context situations and individuals uh, so absolutist absolutist uh, perspective or the objective uh, perspective on morality and ethics uh, they are called essentialist you know, uh, uh, for them good and evil are inherent qualities of actions so uh, you know actions inherently essentially good or bad this is the reason why god orders them uh, so mutazila uh, accepts this uh, position and if uh, actions are good or bad essentially we can discover uh, whether something is good or bad by our action but we still need revelation to confirm what we have uh, discovered but our mind is sufficient to independently discover what's right and wrong. Uh, but the, the matter it is, you know, uh, they also accept that uh, there are, you know, uh, uh, essential qualities of good and bad, but uh, uh, they are um, intelligible, they are uh, understandable by uh, human beings, but not always. Uh, that's why we need divine uh, revelation. Uh, so uh, less uh, independent role is assigned to human reason by uh, Maturidis. But uh, the SRIs adopt the opposite uh, perspective. Uh, they say uh, good and evil are determined by the divine command. 
you know, uh, if Allah says something is good, it's good. If Allah says something is bad, it's bad. Nothing is essentially good or bad. Uh, this is the Ash'ari uh, position. It is non-essentialist. Uh, uh, and the similar uh, debates uh, exist in the Western intellectual history. Uh, for instance, Peter Abelard, Thomas Aquinas, they argue that intention is the criterion that makes an act good or bad. John Locke and Leibniz, they argue that pleasure uh, uh, and happiness uh, are what makes an action good or bad. And uh, the uh, utilitarianists uh, uh, argue like uh, Richard Cumberland, Jeremy Betham, and uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, that utility uh, is what makes something good. Uh, so whatever benefits the individual and society is good. So this is their uh, argument. Uh, you see that there are different criterion used by different uh, positions. And uh, uh, that's why it's called uh, relativism you know, uh, and uh, subjectivism, uh, whether intention or pleasure or utility. So different criteria uh, are used. Uh, uh, what are the sources of morality, uh, reason, human nature, God, or society? Considered, they are considered among the major sources of morality. So some of these sources are internal sources, internal to human being, and some are external to human being. So internal sources include reason, human nature, because uh, some uh, philosophers argue uh, reason uh, decides what's good or bad. Some say human nature determines what's good or bad. But then uh, the others argue uh, society determines what's good or bad, or God, divine revelation, determines what's good or bad. These are external uh, sources. And uh, in the West, uh, each theoretical position in ethics uh, accepts one of these sources, you know, as the source of uh, morality. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so there are different positions like the utilitarianism. Uh, they argue that greatest, greatest good for greatest number of people. This is what makes uh, something uh, moral and uh, ethical. And, uh, but this, uh, position is criticized uh, because uh, it is argued that uh, can we know the individual preferences you know uh, who decides you know what's good for uh, people you know uh, also how do you calculate consequences of something can we know uh, the consequence of everything you know a hundred percent for instance uh, like a vaccination how do you know the uh, consequence of it uh, are you sure uh, hundred percent about it. Uh, 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 so th this is how utilitarianism is uh, criticized. Uh, then uh, uh, another school of thought in ethics is called deontology. Uh, uh, this is represented by uh, uh, German philosopher Kant. Uh, so for them, what matters is the motive. So there are principles and they are universally applicable uh, everywhere regardless of the context uh, but this is criticized as inflexible you know uh, and no clear way to resolve moral duties when they conflict and uh, uh, some principles may result in clash with what's best for uh, human welfare uh, so because they don't take the context into account they just focus on the principle don't lie regardless uh, so this is what's called deontology and there is also another major uh, school of thought in ethics is called virtue ethics. Uh, for them, what matters is the character. If somebody has good character, everything he does is ethical and uh, moral. So they focus on uh, the character of uh, human being and disregard other aspects of uh, ethics. Uh, uh, so you see that uh, some of these schools of thought, they uh, focus on norms. Some focus on the actor, some focus on the act. Uh, uh, those who focus on norms, uh, they especially pay attention to source of the ethical norms. 
whether it is God or reason, uh, as argued by Kant, society, as argued by Durkheim, individual self, as argued by relativist, sense and feelings, as argued by Hume. Or they focus on the type of norm, whether it's universal or relative. And then another school of thought, you know, uh, they study, uh, they focus on the actor, uh, whether the actor is virtuous or not. And then uh, some schools of thought in ethics, they focus on the act, you know, uh, the action uh, itself. Uh, for instance, the Kantian deontology focuses on the act, regardless of the actor and regardless of the uh, consequences of the uh, action. Uh, uh, and utilitarianism, they focus on consequences of the uh, action. So you see, uh, they focus only on one dimension of the uh, ethical uh, process, where either focus on norm or the actor or the act uh, itself. Uh, however, the multiplex approach to ethics uh, focuses on all these uh, uh, levels, aspects, and dimensions. Uh, uh, so, for instance, with respect to the sources of uh, norms, uh, God is accepted as a source of norm, like Sharia, reason, same, society, again, is accepted as a source of moral norms, and individual self, again, these are all accepted as sources of Sharia. So, uh, you know, they, they have a place in Usul al uh, <clears throat> Uh, and the same way, uh, norms are uh, relative. Uh, some norms are relative. Some norms are universal in uh, Fuku and Islamic uh, ethics. Uh, and the same way, the actors, you know, uh, and their relationship with society, nature, and God, this is also taken into account. Uh, so the multiplex ethics, as represented by Usul Fuku and Hikmet Ameli. Uh, 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 presents a holistic perspective to uh, ethics, uh, not focusing only uh, on one dimension uh, or one uh, level. Uh, so, uh, multiplex norms, uh, 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 sources of ethical norms from the multiplex perspective, uh, as we have mentioned, sense perception, reason, and revelation, these are sources of moral knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, not just the reason, not just the divine revelation, because uh, Christian Christians they focus on divine command. Divine command. It's what determines what's right and wrong. Or like uh, Kant, they say rationalist, focusing only on reason. You know, utilitarians. Uh, focusing on uh, the outcomes, consequences. But you see here you have a, a multiplex uh, approach to the sources of moral uh, knowledge. Uh, and also social basis of ethical norms, like public interest, maslaha, or custom earth uh, of a society. You see that the society may also serve as a source of uh, uh, ethical norms. Uh, and the same way, uh, some ethical norms are accepted to be universal and some accepted to be uh, relative. Uh, uh, and uh, when we talk about uh, 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 ethical uh, structure uh, of human uh, action, we don't uh, generalize uh, because we uh, recognize that there are different types of people. You know, some people are uh, guided by their uh, nefs, by their hedonistic self. Some people are guided by their reason, yeah, and some people are in between. Uh, so you cannot say, okay, uh, all people act based on uh, rule, or all people act you know, based on this or that. Uh, you know, depending on the uh, type of the self a person has, his uh, moral actions, uh, uh, are uh, determined uh, by the type of self uh, they have. We have already discussed this. This is very central in Islamic uh, ethics. So there are people who are at the level of nafs and mara. You know, they are guided by their hedonistic self. All their actions are 
you know, uh, motivated by uh, hedonism. Uh, and there are people, you know, who are guided by their uh, content self, which is here I call like type three self, you know, their actions are motivated by their rational thinking. Uh, and, uh, but then there are some people, actually majority of the people, they swing, you know, between uh, rational motives and also hedonistic motives, you know, uh, or their uh, passions. Uh, uh, so in the multiplex uh, uh, ethical action, even the, uh, the, 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 the goodness and badness of an action uh, is categorized into two groups, uh, Hassan Lizatihi and Hassan Ligairihi. Hassan Lizatihi, that means an action is good in itself. And Hassan Ligairihi, an action is good based on uh, its consequences. So this is a consequentialist perspective. Uh, and again, this is part of the usul uh, fiqh because we judge uh, some actions as good uh, because they are good in themselves. We judge some actions are good. Why? Because they have good consequences. There is an external reason that makes it uh, good. Uh, so it's called Hassan al uh, uh, And uh, also, uh, when we classify good and bad actions, we again apply a multiplex uh, perspective in our uh, normative uh, thinking, uh, like a fard, wajib, mustahab, mubah, makru, makru, tahrim, and, and haram. So these are all uh, 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 categories of uh, uh, and, uh, uh, values you know, we use when we uh, evaluate uh, and uh, action. Uh, uh, if you ask uh, uh, a modern or Western uh, moral thinker or uh, philosopher of ethics, uh, what's the value of this action? What's the ethical value that can attach to a particular action? They say ethical or un unethical, moral or immoral. But if you ask the same question to a faqih, you know, to a Muslim uh, 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 thinker of ethics, uh, what's the value you can attach to a single uh, action? Uh, it's one of these seven. It may be fard, wajib, mustahab, mubah. You see that there are four categories of good, good action. A good action may fall in one of these four categories. Fard, wajib, mustahab, mubah. And then bad action may be haram, Maybe makro tahrim and maybe makro tanzihan. You know, uh, it's not a dual logic uh, because uh, modern Western ethics and law work with dual et dual logic, good or bad. You know, uh, moral or immoral, legal or illegal. But uh, fiqh uh, logic uh, is a multi-valued uh, logic. Uh, the logic of Islamic ethics and morality is a multi-valued uh, logic. It's much more nuanced and much more sophisticated than the dual logic presently used in modern ethical uh, thought. Uh, uh, so the result is uh, what we call uh, maratib al-ahkam or multiplex uh, normativity. And uh, uh, this multiplex, uh, multiplexity is not reflected on the uh, multi-valued logic, uh, but also uh, there are levels of uh, good normative action. You know, good action has levels. Uh, uh, so let me explain this uh, with an example. If someone does something bad to you, how do you respond? What's the norm? So you may be, you may uh, reciprocate, you may do the same, same thing back, or you may forgive, or you may do a favor. You see that there is, these are three types of uh, you know, actions, and all three are accepted to be moral from Islamic uh, perspective. So uh, the morality of reciprocity, the morality of tolerance, and the morality of altruism. So reciprocity is called sharia, 
because it is yeah, it accepts legal norms based on reciprocity, kasas. And then uh, tolerance morality is called uh, the level of tariqa because it's based on tolerance and uh, forgiving. And the uh, morality of altruism is the highest morality based on uh, altruism or ether, adherence, adherence, like giving priority to the other. This was called uh, altruism. This is called the hakika uh, akhlaq, hakika morality. So sharia, tariqa, hakika, these are the three uh, levels of uh, morality. So the altruistic uh, morality is the morality of the prophets, ashab, evliyaullah, and the ulama. Sharia is for common uh, people. That's the minimum uh, standard of uh, morality. So sharia is common to everybody and it's mandatory. But uh, tariqa and hakika, tolerance morality or altruism, this is voluntary. Depending on the spiritual level of people, they may uh, practice or uh, don't practice. It's up to them. No one can impose uh, people to uh, not to reciprocate, uh, just to tolerance or uh, altruism. This is uh, voluntary. Mm. Uh, so ethical life of a Muslim uh, has two domains. Uh, one domain is regulated by Islam, and the other domain is intentionally left unregulated by Islam. Okay, uh, so Islam uh, uh, enacts norms, you know, uh, legislates to regulate our uh, some uh, part of our life, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, the legislation uh, is either based on uh, definitive norms, kat'iyat, or it's based on zaniyat, non-definitive norms. Uh, okay, and what's definitive, what's not definitive, uh, depends on the uh, evidence, the certainty of evidence used to ground uh, that norm. So if the evidence is certain, then the norm is certain and binding. But if the evidence is uncertain, then the norm is also uh, uncertain. Uh, so we have two uh, types of regulated domain. Uh, uh, one is uh, regulated universally uh, based on certain norms. The other is relative uh, because it's based on uh, non-definitive zanni uh, norms uh, and then there is the mubah domain uh, th this is the domain which is uh, unregulated intentionally unregulated it's not neglected but allah ta'ala did not regulate this domain so in a muslim's ethical life uh, there is a part uh, which is uh, re regulated with a certainty everyone must obey them uh, these rules are universal and then uh, the other uh, uh, domain uh, which is regulated by zanni uh, evidence uh, uncertain evidence there is ishtihad and there is fatwa uh, diversity in that domain and then the mubah domain is left completely free uh, to uh, people because it's uh, mubah so these are the three uh, levels of uh, multiplex ethics in the life of a Muslim. You know, uh, there are some rules you have to obey. They are certain and universal. There are rules that are relative based on your mezhab, based on the fatwa you adopt. And then there is the mubah domain is completely left to you, individualistic and uh, subjective. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, modernist uh, ethics uh, is based on the first category, they say uh, in morality, everything is universal, everything is certain, and it should be standard for everyone. But in reaction to this, the postmodernists, they say everything is mubah, individualistic, subjective, and relative. So <laughs> you know, they are adopting one uh, level and trying to generalize it. Uh, but the multiplex perspective uh, is a very balanced and nuanced uh, perspective 
recognizing that uh, some ethical rules are universal, some are relative, and there is also a subjective and individualistic domain left to people uh, themselves. Uh, so this is the practical outcome of uh, multiplexity in one's life. Uh, 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 so far, we have been like discussing the theoretical uh, aspects of uh, morality, but uh, Allah Ta'ala, out of his uh, grace, uh, presented a practical embodiment of good morality to uh, people. It is the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wassalam. So it's the like uh, if you don't care about philosophy, all these theoretical debates and everything. So there is a concrete example in front of you. Just follow the Sunnah, but the practical example of Prophet Muhammad and his followers, as Salaf as Salihin, and the teachers who came after them. In a, uh, because they uh, adopted excellence in ethics, makarim uh, akhlaq. So if you are a very practical-minded person, you have no time to read all these philosophical debates and discussions. Just follow the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad wasalam, And this is what Muslims did. Yeah, I mean, majority of Muslims did. The masses did. You know, over uh, centuries. Uh, 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 so some examples of the, uh, you know. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the 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 sunnah, you know, uh, I mean, like uh, greeting other people, like Rasulullah said, you know, uh, you know, uh, greeting other people, you know, is a is, is a charity, you know, feeding other people, smiling to others, being kind to uh, others. Uh, these are all practical things. Uh, uh, so the sunnah includes theoretical discourse and practical excellence. Uh, and Sunnah teaches us practice what you preach. Unlike moral philosophy, it's very realistic and very practical. Very practical. You know, uh, I mean, it's like from smiling to people to brushing your teeth, you know, washing your hands before eating and after eating. You know, like very practical. <laughs> uh, it's not about uh, philosophy, you know. Uh, so realized at the individual level, family level, and also social uh, level. Uh, so the legacy of a prophet is a sunnah, good morality embodied in his life and relationship, but not a philosophy or an abstract uh, discourse. Uh, and uh, in the Quran, Allah Ta'ala praised Rasulullah uh, He said, وَإِنَّكَ لَا عَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ You are, you know, you have an excellent uh, morality, kulukun azim, and Rasulullah said, "Bu'ithu li utamim makaram al akhlaq." I am appointed, I am sent to perfect, excellent uh, morality. So uh, his project was a, a project of morality, a project of ethics, you know, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> so futuwa. Uh, we have Futuwa literature in Islam, as I have mentioned in the beginning. Uh, you know, it is produced by great scholars to popularize the Sunnah uh, principles to general masses. Uh, it's like codified ethics, you know, codified ethics, simplified ethics, popularized ethics, so that everyone in society can learn. Children, young people, you know, uh, they can uh, learn it. Uh, so the first person who wrote uh, the Futuwa book uh, is Abu Abdurrahman as sulami He authored his book, Kitabul Futuwa, 1,000 years ago. Uh, and it's still there. And it's translated to English as a Sufi chivalry. You can buy it uh, and read it, a very short uh, book. Uh, and in Arabic, it's called Kitabul Futuwa. So uh, Abu Abdurrahman as sulami he was a great scholar, but he wrote this uh, short book, you know, uh, so that young people can learn, you know, uh, and he made it like very uh, simple. And Alhamdulillah, I also, you know, uh, wrote uh, a book on uh, Futuwa uh, in Turkish, uh, and it's translated to English uh, also. And uh, I hope to get it published uh, uh, soon, uh, inshallah. It's a very short book, 100 pages, yeah, and it has only 40 rules of Futuwa so that young people can read it easily and uh, put it in uh, practice. Is codified, listed, 
uh, ethical principles, do this, do this, do that, you know, and don't do that, don't do that. So do's and don'ts, a very simple, uh, because some people, this is what they like. Some people like philosophy of everything, but some people like only like very practical uh, examples. Uh, uh, so Abdurrahman al sulami wrote in uh, one of his books uh, uh, where he answered the question, who deserve the rank of Futuwe? And he said, may Allah bestow uh, his mercy upon all of whom, who has Prophet Adam's apology. So Futuwe, you know, somebody who has uh, the Prophet uh, Adam's apology, so he's like uh, somebody who adopts Adam as a role model and apologizes like him. Prophet, uh, Prophet Nuh's perseverance, Prophet Ibrahim's dignity, Prophet Ishmael's correctness, Prophet Moses' sincerity, Prophet Ayyub's patience, Prophet David's cry, and Prophet Muhammad's generosity. You see that in Futuwa ethics, all prophets, they are presented as role models. And actually, this is taken from the Quran, because Quran uh, 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 presents all messengers of Allah as role models, uh, moral role models. Uh, and the Futuwa is based on this. Uh, but you see, it's simplified uh, for people to understand. Uh, uh, again, may Allah be pleased with uh, all of them. Who has Abu Bakr's pity, Omar's charity, Osman's prudency, Ali's knowledge. You see, uh, uh, Sahabe, Ashab, are also presented as role models. Uh, and the most distinguishing quality, moral quality, is mentioned uh, as part of the role model. And then together with all these, if he despises his soul and sees his faults, so he has no pride, uh, that person has the highest morality of Futuwa. He deserves the name Fatah. Uh, uh, so uh, in brief, uh, Futuwa ethics is the ethics of uh, messengers of Allah and their followers. Uh, uh, and, this, uh, uh, and in the Futuwa literature, uh, prophets, ashab, they are presented as role models. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, in Islam, we have a very rich ethical literature. Uh, there are books written by uh, jurists like Fukaha. Uh, a good uh, example is Al Mawardi, his book Adab al Dunya wa Din. And then uh, the, the Sufis, uh, they wrote. Uh, many ethical uh, books on ethics, like Al Ghazali, Jalal Rumi. Actually, all Tasawwuf books may be considered as books on ethics. Uh, and then practical philosophy, like Al Hikmah Al Amaliyya, you know, uh, philosophers like Farabi, Kanal Zade, Tashkop Zade, they authored books, you know, uh, from this uh, perspective. So you see, uh, there is a very rich uh, literature. You know, by uh, jurists, by uh, Sufis, by uh, philosophers on uh, ethics. It's not just a single uh, genre. Uh, so let's talk about uh, 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 reflection of uh, ethics on uh, human rights uh, in Islam. Uh, uh, we have already discussed in my previous lectures about what made Islam an open uh, civilization. So there are three important elements, the multiplex worldview, the epistemology of Zaniyat in Fikr, and also the Ademiya principle. These three uh, principles uh, are what made Islam an open uh, civilization. Uh, and the summary of it is, uh, is uh, uh, expressed in this legal uh, maxim, al-Isma bil Ademiya, inviolability is due to uh, humanity. And uh, uh, when we say humanity, it includes Muslims and non-Muslims, and is clearly expressed by Ibn Abdin, the great uh, Hanafi faqih from Damascus. Uh, he said, al adami mukarramun shar'an walaw kafran. Like all human beings are dignified, uh, untouchable, uh, protected, even if they are uh, non-Muslim, even if they are infidels. Uh, so uh, religion of somebody does not matter. Uh, everyone is uh, mukarram, dignified, honored by and protected by uh, Sharia. Uh, so there are uh, 
different uh, uh, scholars who wrote uh, on this issue. We have uh, already uh, discussed these things in detail in one of my uh, lectures, so I skip this. But I would like to read this citation from Imam Sarakhsi, you know, uh, who died in 1090. Uh, he's a very famous uh, Hanafi uh, jurist. So he wrote that uh, upon creating uh, human beings, God graciously bestowed upon them intelligence and the capability to carry responsibilities and rights. Uh, zimme, which is legal uh, personality, this was to make them ready for duties and rights determined by God. Then he granted them the right to inviolability, freedom and property. So Allah Ta'ala granted everyone when he's born these three rights, right to inviolability, right to freedom and right to fr property. These three fundamental rights. Why did God, did Allah Ta'ala grant these rights to them? To let them continue their lives in such a way that they can perform the duties they have shouldered. Then these rights to carry responsibility and enjoy rights, freedom and property exist with a human being when he is born. So you see, you know, uh, these are born rights by every human being. And this is what Sarakzi wrote in 1090. Uh, uh, before I came across you know, with this citation, I used to think that the, the idea of uh, born rights, you know, it emerged for the first time in the West and Muslims you know, uh, learned uh, from them. But you see that uh, in 1090, in the 11th century, Sarakzi wrote this. And he's not the first one who wrote this. Uh, I have some articles, you know, uh, on this issue, tracing this uh, idea. Uh, so these rights uh, to carry responsibility and enjoy rights, freedom and property exist with every human being when he's born. The insane child or the sane adult are the same concerning these rights. This is how the proper personhood is given to him when he's born for God to charge him with the rights and duties when he's born. In this regard, the insane child and the sane adult are equal. This is from uh, Usul al-Saraqsi. All right, uh, so al-Isma uh, al-Adamiya, this is the uh, very important legal maxim. So every child of Adam is qualified for the right to inviolability, regardless of whether they are male or female, rich or poor, white or black, Muslim or non-Muslims. Uh, uh, so this uh, 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 expresses the universal perspective in Islamic law. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, multiplex ethics offers an alternative model to understand and explain morality based on the following premises. First, sources of norms are multiplex. Divine revelation, reason, senses, society, individual self. These are all sources of norms. And, and norms are multiplex universal and relative. Normative value of actions are multiplex, obligatory, recommended, neutral, disliked, and prohibited. You know, uh, uh, fard, wajib, sunnah, mubah, makru. You know, uh, uh, self is multiplex. Uh, there is nafs al-ammara, nafs al and nafs al And moral action is multiplex. Uh, it may be based on reciprocity principle or tolerance principle or altruism uh, principle. All are uh, legitimate and acceptable. Reciprocity is mandatory. This is the minimum standard to be accepted and implemented in society. Tolerance and altruism are voluntary. An action is either uh, good in itself or good for its consequences. You know, husun li zati or husun li ghairihi. All right, uh, so this is the summary of uh, the multiplex uh, perspective. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Now uh, I'll be happy to address your uh, questions, comments, and uh, hear your uh, objections and contributions. Uh, Thank you very much, Professor uh, Shantuk. Uh, that was a fantastic talk, actually. You know, you've uh, a lot of coins have dropped in my head today from history and um, putting a context of morality and and the idea of where usul and fiqh and morality morality go together. Um, I would like to open up the floor for questions and comments. So, uh, whoever would like to ask a question, please feel free to raise your hand and uh, I will point you, you'll unmute yourself and then uh, uh, please 
uh, ask your question. Also, you can ask your question on the on our chat uh, forum, uh, which is part of Zoom. Uh, welcome to type uh, your question there, and I'll try and read out on, on that. So uh, please, uh, the floor is open for any comments or questions. Yeah, you can do a digital hands up, uh, Mr. Shamsuddin Abu Bakr, but I will allow you to unmute yourself since you put your hand up first. And please ask your question. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, Salam alaikum. Thank you very much, Professor, for your enlightening uh, lecture. And just back, going back to Saraksi's uh, human rights. Um, can we say Umar bin Khattab was before him when Umar bin Khattab said, Mata istabal tumun nas waqad walidat umha tub ahrara? Thank you. Yes, uh, you know, uh, there are many examples. Uh, as I said, you know, Saraksi is not the first one, you know, uh, to say things like that, but he formulated them in a very philosophical uh, way, you know, uh, you know uh, put in the philosophical framework. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, the first source is the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah and the Ashab. So there is a chain of authorities. Then Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi'i, Ahmed bin Hanbal. You know, uh, then comes like uh, Imam Yusuf, uh, Muhammad Shaybani. Uh, then comes uh, Saraksi. Saraksi is like the fourth or fifth generation in, uh, in that uh, regard. Uh, so uh, his contribution is to systematize, you know, what he received uh, you know, uh, before him and uh, made like a, a general uh, a normative philosophical framework uh, for it. Uh, and as I said, he's not the first one, he's not the last one. I just uh, chose him as an example. Uh, I have like many articles on uh, the uh, genealogy uh, of uh, Universal human rights in Islam, Isma and Adamiya, and how they emerged and how they uh, practiced, uh, who are the representatives throughout the uh, centuries. Uh, so you can uh, consult those uh, articles. You may visit my webpage, rejepsenturk.com, and then you can find uh, some of the uh, articles there. And I have two books in Turkish and many articles in English and also in Arabic. Uh, you, you, I mean, if you are interested, you know, in exploring uh, more, you can uh, read them. Right. Thank you for that. Any any particular questions? If not, I just uh, I mean, while you're thinking of questions, I wanted to share a little scenario from my student days when I was uh, uh, early days. I used to uh, study under a stud, um, uh, especially Usul al Fiqh. Uh, when I was a um, sort of um, a new medical student, I was. A parallel studying um, on the issue, I've got fascinated by uh, the idea of usul al fiqh, and I remember a fellow student who uh, we were driving. It, it used to take an hour to drive from where I used to live to go and visit the sheikh. And um, uh, in the car, uh, a fellow student was uh, having some a packet of crisps, potato chips, with some. If you're not familiar with it, and um, he was uh, the flavor. The flavor was actually bacon flavored potato chips. Now, the bacon flavored potato chips is actually halal. Uh, it's, uh, you know, there's no haram ingredient in it because the bacon flavoring is actually a chemical flavoring and it didn't originate from, from, uh, from the, the pig, uh, the swine. Now, this young man tried to force the crisp onto me saying, Ali, you must have this because it's halal. And why not? Why are you denying something Allah's permitted for you? And uh, because it is, it is permitted for you, so you must have it. You should have it. You should try it. I said, no, no, no. Anything, uh, I do not want anything to do with the word pork or bacon or swine, anything to do with that. I have the, the kub in me, the hatred towards the word is something that has been built to me from the day I was a young man and anything to do with the swine. And he goes, no, I don't have an issue with that because it's halal. So you shouldn't deny what God has permitted. So he basically complained to the Ustad and, uh, when he went. And Ustad listened to both sides. And he said, look, this is the difference between you and Ali. Uh, he, you're looking for the permissibility and maybe he's seeking a higher value in this. And this, which is interesting, what you were just discussing about the way the mind is formed. It is sometimes beyond 
the actual uh, the permissibility, what Shara Sharia permits of the halal muba mandu makru, and and our likes and dislikes within the Islamic framework is shaped by that. So it's an yeah. interesting uh, scenario, and he was he still couldn't understand it till this day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, both are ethical, both are moral. Yeah. You know, uh, as I said, you know there are you know uh, different it's levels framework, uh, yeah. of morality and uh, ethics. Uh, so uh, he's uh, acting upon the uh, minimum uh, standard. Uh, so he's okay. You know, no okay. one can blame him, and no one can uh, impose on him. You know, don't do that. Uh, you know, uh, because uh, this is the free uh, domain, yeah. uh, and also you are also free. You know, stay away uh, from it. <laughs> but what's interesting, Professor Rajab, uh, is maybe because of that. You know, this your framework. The the they're trying to bring social thinking into multiplex thinking, where normally we are all uniplex. Our default position is a uniplex sort of uh, standard. And therefore, the conflicts in society is because of that uniplex approach. So mm -hmm. there was a big fisting sort of struggle in the car at that time because <laughs> of our uniplex approach at that time. And uh, I guess if you put it to the wider society, uh, you know, the conflicts that we see within the schools of thought, even today, uh, within the Muslim world or with any society where people say, look, this is the correct way of understanding something. And therefore, everybody else is incorrect. You are making a proposal here. There is a bit more than that and a bit more nuanced yes. approach to this. Yeah. 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 I mean, as we have discussed earlier, you know, multiplexity uh, is the best uh, tool of diversity management. Yeah. You know, is the best ground for uh, pluralism, uh, you know, uh, in uh, society. Uh, so, I mean, like, uh, you know, multiplex ethics is plural uh, ethics, uh, the pluralist uh, ethics, uh, but it's not amorphous, like postmodernist, you know, yeah. uh, the postmodernist uh, is amorphous, you know, uh, has no structure, but multiplexity offers a structure but at the same time, pluralist. Uh, mm. so that's the advantage uh, of it. Uh. Yeah. yeah. So we have another question for you, or two questions. I'll ask uh, Ahmed, uh, please, uh, Nala Chayoglu, if that's the right way to say it. I apologize for my lack of inability to pronounce the Turkish word there. Please do, uh, why don't you enlighten us with how you say your surname? Nalcajoglu. Uh, thank you thank you uh, please uh, uh, please ask your question to professor yeah, i got one remark and uh, a question actually my remark is like i mean you said that like muslim ethics or the multiplex ethics is not as amorphous as like uh, postmodernist but the title of the series i just put a comment over there to the decolonizing social se social series it's, it sounds very uh postmodernist very postcolonial theory and actually i wasn't going to listen to this topic thinking that here we're going to be deconstructing like the white man's social values and rebuild it. I wish it was titled different. I think it was a beautiful talk. Now, my question is, with regards to your research into Islamic like structure of ethics, the multiplex, where there's like a the divine domain and there's like the personal domain, how is this in the Christian and Jewish theology? Is this like, a, again, a wide range of like, do we see, do we see like from all the way from halal to haram, like in, in Christian theology? Or, or do they, is, is it a chance that the, the Western, minds that came out of that culture focused towards like this uh like single mind i, I forgot the, the technical term but uh rather than multiplex i mean is this coming from the background or have you seen this in other theologies it's just yes. something i'm very unfamiliar of thank you yes uh, yeah thank you very much for your comment on the title of the series uh, so in my view uh, uh postmodern means islam you know uh you know, the, the end of uh, modernity and postmodernity will open the ground for uh, Islam, inshallah. Uh, and Islam will embrace uh, all their uh, legitimate uh, and grounded uh, gains uh, and production within this uh, multiplex holistic uh, perspective. You know, uh, I mean, we are not going to reject or deny uh, the legitimate uh, outcome of modernity or postmodernity or the or the rationally or empirically proven and grounded uh, outcomes uh, of uh, the modern or postmodern uh, thinkers uh, uh, in this uh, multiplex uh, uh, perspective. So if it's grounded on rationality, if it's grounded on uh, empirical research, uh, you know, uh, we welcome them because this is what multiplexity 
uh, uh, offers uh, to us, uh, uh, but uh, you know, this is our goal to make Islam uh, what will come after postmodernity, post postmodernity, inshallah. Ta'ala. So, the uh, multiplexity is the name of uh, the next generation, the avant garde, uh, the next generation of. Uh, uh, of thinking uh, and thought, uh, uh, this it's universal, it's uh, holistic, uh, it's all comprehensive. Uh, uh, and uh, with respect to the second part of your question, like uh, Christians, uh, you know, uh, they uh, their ethical uh, perspective is based on divine command, divine command, which is very similar to Ashari uh, perspective, but. Uh, uh, how do you know divine command? Uh, in their perspective, this is through church. You know, like church tells you the divine command. You are not supposed to make ishtihad. You are not supposed to uh, think by yourself. But in Islam, uh, through in the Ashari position, uh, they say uh, right and wrong are determined by God's uh, revelation. But there's usul fiqh, the methodology of fiqh. And uh, scholars are required to use usul fiqh to make ishtihad themselves. Uh, there is no like authority like church you know, uh, to tell you uh, what is right and wrong. And there is no infallible authority like Pope. You know, we as human beings, you know, uh, we are supposed to read the Quran and the Hadith and uh, you know uh, learn uh, in, uh, and make ishtihad following usul fiqh following this uh, methodology. See what I mean? Uh, so different systems uh, in Islam and, uh, and Christianity. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, question, which uh, allowed me to bring this uh, dimension. Uh, so the Islamic perspective is more pluralist, you know, allowing uh, individual scholars to use their minds and rationality to explore God's will. Yeah. Yeah, Ahmed, but, uh, Ahmed, before I take the next call, just not to put you on the spot, so I will give you some time. So, uh, if you can think of a better way of phrasing the title of this talk, to uh, now you've listened to the content, <laughs> you've listened to the content. If you reverse engineer the title for us, you have another half an hour or so if you can, I'll be grateful. <laughs> and maybe make a suggestion how the title could be put, put together. It would be worthwhile from your perspective right. uh, okay I mean, yeah have a think about it no pressure okay all right. I mean, well, well, you can say too i mean like i can think some but like islamic ethics as the alternative to as a way of multi-plurality I'm, I'm not in the field i'm an engineer but it's, yeah, just, sure. yeah, it's, <laughs> no, no, it's, it's a good feedback it's good feedback and uh, you know if you if you if something stopped you from potentially not listening that wouldn't be our intention uh, so, if, you know, that, that's it was an earlier this topic, and I thought it was uh, some postmodernist talk. I didn't know what it was about. I missed the audience. Yeah, yeah. No worries. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, we will go to uh, Bushra Punjabi. Uh, please, Bushra, if you'd be kind enough to lower your hand, unmute yourself, and feel free to ask your question, please, or comment. Yeah. Um, uh, Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, it, it, it was a really enlightening talk. And um, I'm from Kashmir, and I have a question that because we have been talking about decolonizing social sciences, that is what the series have been all about. So my question is that uh, for somebody who, who is a colonized subject under a non-Muslim rule, how can uh, such a person or such a social science student or a researcher put the multiple ethics and uh, the way it was linked with the human rights could put it to practical use, you know, when while dealing with the question of decolonizing the social sciences per se. And uh, I have another question with regard to the, I'm not sure if I followed it correctly, with regard to the self, uh, isn't it that most of the time a common person swings between the three types of self? Uh, for example, the same person sometimes, um, he goes out to seek out the hedonistic pleasure, pleasures and sometimes he reads the level of the nafs mutmainna. Um, so, uh, would it be wrong to say that we sort of uh, swing from nafs amara to the nafs mutmainna? 
Yes. Thank uh, you. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's begin from the uh, second question. You are right. Uh, you know, this is called nefs lewame, which is the type two self. You know. Uh, 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 so type two self nefs lewame. You know, swings between reason and hedonistic self. So uh, there is no dominant uh, uh, power. You know, uh, neither reason is dominant nor hedonistic self is uh, dominant. Uh, and majority of people are like this. Uh, but our goal should be uh, elevating uh, ourselves to nefs mutmainne, completely under the guidance of reason. Uh, but this reason is different than like materialist reason. Yeah? Uh, this is a metaphysic, uh, metaphysical reason. Uh, not the reductionist uh, reason. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, and with respect to your uh, first uh, question, how you put it in practice? Uh, uh, so what uh, uh, I am uh, aiming with these uh, lectures is to decolonize our minds and our hearts. You know, uh, and political uh, uh, decolonization uh, I believe comes after decolonizing our minds and hearts. You know, uh, so if our minds and hearts remain colonized by uh, this uh, reductionist, uniplex, uh, look, atheist, materialist uh, philosophies, social sciences, and the ways of thinking, what's the benefit of having political decolonization? You know. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, uh, decolonization has levels, you know, like uh, decolonizing your heart, decolonizing your mind, and also political decolonization. Many countries today, they are politically decolonized, but they are intellectually colonized. You know, uh, they are culturally colonized, spiritually uh, colonized. Uh, uh, so we have to uh, be aware of multiple levels of uh, decolonization uh, from the cultural hegemony uh, of uh, this hedonistic, materialist, atheistic uh, uh, culture, science, ethics. You know, uh, uh, so I'm trying to draw attention uh, to this level. Of course, we are all aware about the need for political uh, decolonization, but as I said, you know, like my country, you know, and many other countries, you know, we have, uh, you know, a political decolonization, we have like political freedom, but unfortunately, we are spiritually colonized, culturally colonized, academically colonized. We don't have intellectual independence. We don't have spiritual independence. You know, uh, so uh, the purpose of uh, the title is to draw attention uh, to this. Uh, our goal should be intellectual independence, uh, spiritual independence, uh, we, uh, along with political independence. And, uh, political independence alone is not sufficient if we are culturally colonized, spiritually uh, colonized, ethically uh, colonized. Uh, so today, some Muslims, they follow liberal ethics. Uh, so that means, you know, they are uh, ethically colonized. You know, their ethical thinking is colonized. Uh, so the purpose of these lectures is to draw attention, you know, to uh, decolonize, emancipate uh, yourself from uh, from this uh, liberal uh, ethics or utilitarian ethics or postmodern ethics. Uh, uh, so that's the uh, purpose of it. Uh, Inshallah, and we wish the best. We wish, uh, I mean, uh, political uh, emancipation uh, to uh, Kashmir uh, also. And uh, but at the same time, you know, we uh, draw attention that political uh, emancipation is not alone if there is no intellectual independence, academic independence, ethical independence, cultural independence. Inshallah, you know, we aim all of them at the same time. I think, uh, Professor, you've probably answered one of the questions uh, our fellow participant, Mac uh, Washiluk, has uh, written uh, on the chat. He says, um, should we strive to overcome uh, politically the dominant modern nation state model for social order 
in a sense of this unilateral one government for one society nation under one fixed law well this is too utopian in this time and age so i guess you would you is there anything else you want to add to that or uh, um, no i think you know uh, i already addressed address this, that yeah yeah, yeah this uh, question yeah i mean uh, political freedom yeah uh, means nothing if there is no spiritual freedom yeah uh, uh, and if there is no uh, intellectual uh, academic uh, freedom so we have to aim uh, to have uh, uh, all these different types or different levels of uh, freedom and independence uh, at the same time so if you are co controlled by your nefs you know uh, by hedonistic self you know by this hedonistic culture you know what's the benefit of uh, being politically free so <laughs> So we have to have all of them at the same time, inshallah. Uh, so hands, uh, Rubayat, uh, you have your hand up. Uh, kindly lower the hand and unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Salam. Chef. Alaikum. Uh, so uh, I have an observation. That's, uh, I think this uh, the effect of uh, this mental colonization uh, at our generation affects uh, people at a very early age, like from school, children get affected by this. Um, sometimes their parents, uh, you know, the society school, they espouse this kind of these kind of uh, uh, non-Muslim ideas. Uh, you know, th th those are not characteristic of this sort of multiplexity. So what what happens is that uh, these children grow up in very ways very damaged uh, psychologically uh, you know intellectually and they can't fulfill their uh, uh, potential so in this regard have you seen any work uh, or do you have any plans uh, or can we make any sort of plans to address this uh, you know youth uh, the parents the sort of like society uh, that, that's yes, uh, yeah, this is a very important uh, question. Uh, today, uh, modern or post modern education is the most effective tool of mental colonization. Uh, I mean, they use uh, education to mentally colonize uh, future generations, uh, you know, and once they receive this uh, modern or postmodern uh, education, children become mentally colonized, spiritually colonized. Their minds and hearts become uh, colonized. You know, uh, uh, so unless we take care of this uh, problem, uh, we will lose all future generations, all our children, you know, to modernity or postmodernity. Uh, Muslims are so naive. You know, when it comes to education and knowledge, they say, oh, this is ilim. This is not ilim, it's ideology. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, sometimes ideology is presented as ilim, as knowledge, as education. And those naive parents, you know, uh, they lose their children. You know, today, like all this IB curriculum, the Montessori curriculum, you know, all these like state curriculums, you know, which uh, impose their uh, ethics you know, uh, and morality on uh, uh, children uh, as if it's natural, as if it's natural, as if it's uh, universal, as if it's objective. You know, uh, so it's very dangerous. Uh, and uh, you know, in this lecture, I try to draw your attention uh, to this that uh, you know uh, this uh, you know uh, liberal ethics uh, or uh, the deontologic ethics uh, or uh, utilitarian ethics these are not the ethics we share you know instead we have futu ethics so our dear brother shamsuddin abikar should teach futu uh, rather than liberal youth ethics you know uh, so <laughs> and uh, you know I, I was troubled when I observed that uh, this liberal atheist, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ethics, uh, and by the way, liberal means mubah, ibahi, ibahi, 
you know, like uh, dating, everything is uh, mubah, you know, uh, so that's why uh, in Arabic, they are called ibahiyun, ibahiyun. That means people who uh, claim everything is mubah. That's what liberalism is about, you know, uh, everything is mubah, you know, uh, everything is subjective, everything is relative. Uh, so uh, we have to be very careful about this and we have to develop a curriculum uh like uh, as an alternative to this ib montessori or this you know like a modernist or postmodernist uh, uh curriculums uh, that are now uh, put in uh, practice in our school uh, systems uh, 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 so we have to think about uh, this and those curriculums uh, you know, uh, whether IB or Montessori or like other types of uh, curriculums, uh, they have inherent in them an ethics. Whether you are aware of it, aware, uh, 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 you know, uh, about it or not. Uh, so this is the inherent uh, ethics, uh, you know, perspective uh, inbuilt with it. Uh, uh, so, so you know, we have to be uh, aware of it and critically analyze those existing uh, uh, curriculums uh, at the elementary level, uh, middle school level, uh, secondary uh, education level, also in the university. Uh, see what I mean? You know, uh, uh, so they offer, you know, uh, an ethical uh, uh, vision uh, without you being aware of it. You uh, you uh, imbibe it, you, you inhale it, you internalize it without even knowing about it. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, so it's a big challenge for teachers, like at the elementary level, you know, uh, secondary school level, also at the university level. But the elementary, middle school, and the secondary school level is very crucial, uh, and we have to work on developing an alternative curriculum. Uh, so if you are interested in this kind of, you know, curriculum building, uh, communicate with me. Uh, let's work together. Inshallah, I have been working on the university curriculum and I gathered, alhamdulillah, enough experience. But now I see elementary school is more important than university. Uh, I mean, middle school or secondary school, high school is more important than university. Because the uh, children's uh, ethical uh, vision, ethical world is shaped, you know, uh, before they come to university. Yeah, and in the university, you cannot change it. Uh, uh, but if they come, you know, with a free, you know, uh, uh, mentality, uh, you can just, you know, uh, help it uh, develop uh, more. But if they are fixed, you know, with a particular kind of uh, understanding of ethics, you know, uh, or worldview, you cannot change it. It's very difficult uh, to uh, change it. So that's why we have to make an alternative curriculum uh, for elementary school, middle school, and secondary school, something uh, which may serve as an alternative IB or Montessori. Uh, and we have to make a curriculum uh, and uh, I'm looking for people who are experts on curriculum making, curriculum design. You know, I can give them the content, but I'm not myself expert on like how you design the technical aspects of curriculum making, you know, for uh, elementary school or middle school or high school, but I can uh, give the content, uh, but then they have to shape it, put it in the framework, you know, that's uh, uh, commensurable with like those IB or Montessori that can be uh, uh, used in uh, education. Right, thank you. Uh, we have uh, three hands up, but I have to take it in order. Uh, uh, Naeem, uh, you've raised your hand, unless you want to pass your hand to somebody uh, else. I, I want to pass it. Because okay, then to... it's uh, Sophia, uh, would you be kind enough to lower your hand and unmute yourself, please, and ask your question. Hello, Salaam alaikum. Um, very interesting, uh, Professor, what you just said. And I uh, 
commend you for that, that there has been so much talk in the past about um, uh, thinking for uh, uh, university level, uh, this multiplex thinking and so on, but there is, a, there is very little for primary and secondary school work. And I'm actually working on that at the moment, creating content. And when you mentioned about this framework, I thought this is brilliant. Uh, I would love to have some more communication with you with regards to that, um, if that is, that's okay. Inshallah, inshallah. You know, there is a dispersed efforts everywhere in the world, you know, like in America, UK, Turkey, yes. you know, like, uh, you know, uh, Arab world, Pakistan, Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, but because they don't work together, they don't produce something viable, you know, something yeah. excellent, you know. Uh, so we have to bring bright minds together from mm -hmm. East and West, from Europe, from America, from Arab yeah. world, from Pakistan, Malaysia, all together and come up with something really nice, excellent, that That's can fine. be uh, uh, applicable everywhere, yeah. in UK, in America, in Malaysia, in Pakistan, in, you know, in Turkey, everywhere. And the, the thing is that a lot of people don't actually get to the university level, a lot of people just study up to metric level and then yes. they drop out. Yes. And the understanding, because I, I work with primary and secondary school students uh, and now, obviously, with COVID, I've started teaching online, and it's just so difficult. Sometimes they don't even read, and it it is actually difficult to convey it to them. And getting them to think even logically, it's it's very tricky. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes you have to educate the parents itself because the parents are all for, oh, we want these grades so they can get into the uh, this private school or that school, this entrance exam. And we just sort of having to explain to the parents that, look, this is the level your child is at. This is how he's learning or she's learning. It's, it's very, very tricky. And it's actually, I'm, I'm so pleased to hear this. Um, I, I, I'm really, really happy. Yes, um, yeah. Definitely communicate with you with regards yeah, to Yeah, yeah, yeah. As uh, you know, our uh, dear brother Rubaiyat suggested, you know, uh, I mean, uh, you know, we should uh, uh, get together, make a workshop, Inshallah. Uh, how we teach this uh, Futuo ethics. This yes. Ethics, you know, uh, to uh, elementary school children, yeah. you know, uh, middle school children, secondary school children. I mm. mean, uh, we have already done some work at the university level, mm. uh, uh, but university is too late. You know, yes. I mean, you, you have to start uh, like at a very early uh, age. Uh, mm. So, uh, I mean, let's, let's communicate. Uh, Inshallah. together Inshallah. and make a workshop on uh, how uh, we can you know uh, present uh, the Futuwa ethics the islamic youth ethics yes which is based on the sunnah of Prophet muhammad and uh, our scholars in previous generations you know uh, they were so uh, practical minded you know, yeah. so they codified it as Futuwa ethics mm. uh, codified uh, so that children can easily learn you know, there is like a poems, uh, mm. you know, Arabic, Persian, Turkish, you know, uh, I'm sure, you know, th th there are a lot of things also in Urdu and Malay, in Indonesian languages uh, as well. Uh, so we have to, uh, you know, uh, revive this tradition. Mm. This is what I call rooted revival. Rooted yeah. revival, you know, uh, I mean, Tejdid Mu'assal, Tejdid Mu'assal, rooted revival and uh, come up with something, you know, for our own uh, children, uh, you know, uh, young children, inshallah. Um, that. Definitely, there's definitely a need for it. And I'm so, so pleased to hear your initiation. It's absolutely wonderful. Thank inshallah. you, Mr. Zakla. So, Sophia, yeah. just before you leave, uh, I'll get in touch with you. Uh, inshallah, uh, thank you. So, that, uh, so brother can, Naim, you know, let's make, uh, let's make, uh, uh, workshop, you know, uh, yeah. invites uh, yeah. uh, uh, interested, uh, but at the same time, uh, experienced people, you know, yeah, not, not just interested, but you know, people with some experience who can contribute yes. uh, to uh, building an alternative curriculum based on this multiplex uh, uh, vision of the world, science, and ethics. Uh, oh, yeah. Inshallah, Tana.
Right. Let's make a multiplex curriculum. You know, <laughs> inshallah. Ta'ala. That would be amazing. Uh, Naeem, did you want to ask your question or are we? Yeah, uh, my, my question was, I just uh, want to uh, raise it quickly. Um, I'm so happy and uh, Professor, you elaborated quite uh, nicely uh, the difference between the uh, Islamic ethics and the uh, modern ethics. So one very uh, important distinction is that the Islamic ethics focused on uh, virtues and uh, personal development and ethical world. But on the other hand, the modern world it focused on it it focused completely shifted from an individual to other people and uh, it uh, basically wanted to de deontologically deontological uh, process it wants to follow the deontological process to uh, the constraints and other uh, uh, the um, previous uh, ethical traditions but what was the consequences? We talked about education, I'll go into uh, next, but if we look at the United States where the education uh, and the um, ethical debate is uh, always constantly uh, evolving, we see the mass, mass school shooting almost every month. So okay. that kind of tells us the story that uh, the modern um, ethics has uh, uh, been kind of failed in, in delivering ethical uh, people or ethical children or ethical person. So do you think the we need, uh, although you touched uh, this point a bit, that we need to overhaul the education system, modern education system, and also decolonize uh, a, a kind of dis discussion or debate is needed to uh, decolonization of the educational system? Uh, anything in that line? What do you think? Yes, uh, I mean, it's an urgent uh, issue for Americans. Uh, for Europeans, you know, uh, it's a very urgent uh, issue uh, to uh, reform uh, the present uh, uh, ethical system, uh, the present uh, educational uh, system, especially at the high school level. You know, uh, the, but uh, but high school is built uh, upon uh, like elementary and middle school. Uh, I mean, you see uh, most of those uh, shootings take place in high school. Uh, so that means there is something wrong and uh, an urgent action must be taken, uh, especially uh, with regard to uh, ethics. You know, like, uh, I mean, what kind of education system produces a child who kills his classmates? You know, <laughs> I mean, uh, they are supposed to be you know, bound together and protecting each other. But uh, we have, you know, it's a, an educational system which alienates, you know, uh, young people uh, from their friends and uh, turns them into monsters, you know, who kills their friends uh, in the same class. Uh, you know, this is very uh, frightening. You know, uh, and uh, still, uh, you know, uh, there are, uh, you know, people uh, who admire American education system. <laughs> you know, uh, this is, you know, Stockholm syndrome, you know, people, you know, uh, falling in love with their uh, murderers. You know, uh, I mean, what, how can you admire, how can you fall in love with such an educational system which produces monsters, you know, uh, at a very young age, you know, children who kill uh, their classmates and friends. Uh, so this is something really urgent. Uh, and uh, and I believe you know we have to do something uh, about this, and this requires us you know to uh, reform uh, the ethics uh, inbuilt in this uh, education uh, system, uh, because of the problem you know uh, in the worldview, because of the problem in the ethical system, uh, in the uh, offered you know to uh, children which is very individualistic very hedonistic, very selfish, you know, uh, without any, uh, like a universal objective uh, principles, uh, these children are, uh, are uh, produced, you know, uh, by this educational system, and we have to do something about, about it. That's why, you know, I am, you know, uh, interested in this suggestion that we make a workshop you know, uh, bringing, uh, you know, uh, together experts on curriculum uh, building, uh, and we can uh, turn this multiplex uh, worldview 
multiplex understanding of uh, science and ethics into a practical curriculum uh, to be offered you know to uh, elementary schools in uh, middle schools and high schools uh, before the university system i mean i'm expert on university education and uh, alhamdulillah you know i designed the university curriculum but now i see this need you know we have to uh, do something earlier university uh, age is too uh, too late you know uh, and uh, all this uh, uh, horrendous uh, uh, like ruthless uh, uh, you know uh, murders shootings taking place in the uh, high school level we have to take some action you know do something about that right uh, i think um Shamsuddin uh, Abiyakar, uh, you've had your hand up, or well, you have your pen up, so you've beaten the beaten beaten the, the virtual hand up. So you're welcome to ask your question, second question before I move to go to Ahmed. Yeah. Thank you. It's not a question for me. Uh, from me, uh, it's about observation about what is the the title of the, going back to what um, Ahmed said about the social science. Social science is, I think it is a deceiving concept because it is used as a generalized uh, concept because science is what is observable and touchable and provable. So that in that context is really, in contrast to the Islamic view, because in Surah Al-Baqarah it says, those who believe unseen. So we believe in unseen thing. Allah, we believe Allah and it's unseen. And that's not a science, but the social science of the West is different than the other. So I think it cannot be generalized and it cannot be applicable the social science to everywhere. So social science is a contextualized phenomena. That's one thing. <clears throat> and the other thing coming back to the curriculum, in here in UK, the government is proposing to start the what they call the LGTB and uh, teaching to the children as young as five years old. So money, I came from Somali originally. Money Somalis from UK moved to Turkey, especially Ankara, because of to escape this program. So what Professor Chan Turk is saying is relevant, and here it's really something needed because these are what they uh, the children need because the families, the Somali families, they thought the Western the in UK uh, curriculum is failing their children morally and spiritually. So that's why they moved to uh, and, 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 uh, Turkey. So I am really fascinated about this, but I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't know a fatua. I'm not familiar a bit with a fatua. Uh, inshallah, inshallah. Uh, okay, uh, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, uh, you know, uh, if I can get, how can I contact you? They will be. Yeah, oh, read, uh, read the book of uh, Sulami, Sulami on uh, Sulami. His book is translated to English as Sufi Chivalry. You know, they translated uh, Futuwa as Sufi Chivalry, but uh, I prefer not to translate it uh, as, uh, you know, as something else. Uh, Futuwa should be uh, taught to everyone. They should learn the concept of Futuwa as it is. Yeah. Uh, because chivalry is something you know christian from middle ages yeah uh, so better to uh, use futuwa without any translation uh, as islamic youth ethics yeah. uh, i think a very interesting point uh, observation by shamsuddin on your on the lecture because he joined us only in the last lecture today but if i remember i cast my mind back to you one of your first first or second lecture, I think, you very much uh, laid the ground to say, look, we shouldn't even, why should we look at Muslim and Islam through the Western social sciences as a, yeah. as a, as a, as a, as a structure? And, mm -hmm. any, and you very nicely detail uh, where the shortcomings come uh, from that when you try and push 
or force the study of Islam and Muslim society through the Western social science culture. So very good point, Shamsuddin. I'd, I'd ask you to go back to the lectures. You probably have, you know, you'll, you'll well, not question, but your observation will be, uh, you, you will agree with uh, Professor Rajib's statement on that as well. And he went into that in detail. I think it's the second lecture, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, on yeah, YouTube. We have oh, yes, we will send you the link. We'll go through oh, all that okay. and you'll have the slides and everything with it as well. Absolutely. Uh, I think, Ahmed, you had your hand up. Or did it disappear again? Or are you? Yeah, I have a question, but I mean, I couldn't just formulate it in my head. So I live in, in the United States and yeah. also I have friends, expats in the Europe too. So what I've seen is with respect to trying to get a better education and moral values, I see a lot of people deciding to send their kids, to, for example, the Christian schools. And it's based on either ethical moral values that are close to them or in terms of like the success, like in terms of like the worldly success. So what would a, uh, what would a uh, curriculum based on these values, like how, how would you, I mean, it's not the right term, but sell it to a Westerner to, for example, pick up because it's so, it has its sources in a divine revelation that belongs to a faith group. Like what would it offer? I mean, like in terms of a comparison, since you've done a, a, academics on, on a university, there are like, for example, uh, universe like Trinity College, there's Yeshua College, like, for example, in your comparison of their curriculums, like, what do you think as such a curriculum from coming from somebody who has created a university curriculum based on our tradition, and you probably have compared with the uh, other like, you know, like faith based like curriculums, like, what do you think will be uh, enticing to uh, somebody from an Abrahamic, especially since this country is like, uh, Judeo-Christian, what would be enticing to them to actually opt for the, one of their kids, for example? Yeah, first of all, uh, we have to uh, uh, provide uh, for the need of the Muslims, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, now there is, uh, you know, like millions of Muslims, you know, living in America and uh, Europe. Uh, so they need a curriculum, you know, to educate their own uh, children. Uh, I think this is enough <laughs> for us to cater for and then when it comes to uh, like other uh, people like uh, you said uh, you know muslims send their children to catholic school or the you know like a jewish school etc why because uh, they think you know okay they uh, serve our purpose so if you provide an excellent educational curriculum i believe you know uh, non-muslims will also send their children because uh, you know who would uh, send uh, his children to a school where you know, uh, you know, uh, children uh, shoot uh, and kill each other. <laughs> See what I mean? So if you offer a better alternative, like a safe place, moral, ethical uh, place, uh, I believe like all the insane uh, non-Muslims will also send their children uh, to that uh, school. And also, you know, uh, uh, what uh, I am presenting is not faith-based. I'm not saying uh, Islamic approach. I'm saying multiplex perspective. You know, we make multiplex curriculum. And multiplexity is shared by uh, many people, you know, uh, you know, uh, because uh, there are many people who are unhappy, discontent with the materialist culture today, you know, uh, with the hedonistic culture, you know, the, uh, culture today. So they are searching for alternatives. You know, uh, so if you offer like a, a multiplex perspective, bringing together, I mean, uh, the uh, material. Uh, uh, as well as the spiritual, rational, you know, uh, uh, as well as empirical and uh, divine uh, uh, revelation uh, together, uh, I, I think, you know, there are lots of people who will be attracted to this balanced, comprehensive and holistic uh, perspective as an alternative to the existing reductionist, materialist, hedonistic uh, 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 and uh, uh, subjective, relative uh, perspective. Uh, Rubayat, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, aware of the time uh, ticking, uh, so probably we'll start closing shortly. I think uh, uh, mindful of uh, the time as well, evening approaches. Rubayat, if you wish to ask your second question or comment, um, you can lower your hand and ask. Yeah. Just uh, maybe like a comment, but basically uh, I've been fascinated by uh, what I heard about uh, Sheikh al Islam Mustafa Sabri uh, is Kirk, like, you know, the, the last uh, great Ottoman uh, Sheikh al Islam. I wanted to know Dr. Rajab Shanturk's uh, views about his uh, work 
you know, especially and, and whether that or like translation of that kind of work would, would help us to sort of, uh, you know, for, for me, like that sort of work, uh, like the works at that sort of intellectual level seem uh, to be a motivation for anybody, Muslim, non-Muslim, whatever, to, to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to prepare themselves to be able to access texts like that. Mm -hmm. For example, like in Bangladesh, like I'm from Bangladesh originally, uh, I, I can work, uh, I can buy a Kant in translation, I can buy Hegel in translation, right? But, but there are great, like you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the great Ottoman scholars here, uh, we don't have that in translation in English. Yes. So maybe, maybe like if we get translations, like Imam Ghazali has been translated extensively, right? But like, I mean, we don't only have Imam Ghazali, we have like huge amounts of scholars. Yeah. Imam Razi is not even translated, like, you know? Uh, a lot like so i'm saying that uh is there some uh thoughts because you, you yeah yeah you know? i mean uh, you know um uh, during the 19th uh, century uh, 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 there were many great scholars ottoman uh, scholars who faced the challenge coming from the west you know modern uh, philosophy social sciences etc and they produced lots of works uh, you know, there are many uh, Mustafa Sabris. You know, uh, I mean, you know, only like a few of them because, uh, you know, they wrote in Arabic and their books are marketed, you know, in the Arab world. Uh, uh, so I believe uh, uh, the, the, the 19th century was very vital intellectually and uh, Ottoman scholars produced lots of works because of the, you know, uh, collapse of the Ottoman uh, Empire, uh, their work, uh, their works uh, have not been, you know, uh, uh, transmitted to the next generations, you know, they are kind of buried, uh, and they are waiting for excavation, translation, dissemination, etc. Many of the questions we are facing today, you know, have been addressed by them, like the reforming Islamic education. You know, they opened many uh, new madrasas with reformed curriculum. Who knows about that? Nobody knows about them. <laughs> you know, uh, and they wrote a lot of uh, work on like ethics, akhlaq, the issue of ethics, psychology, sociology, many works. Uh, but unfortunately, their works remain in the libraries you know, uh, and waiting uh, to be uh, explored uh, more. Uh, so Sheikh Islam Mustafa Sabri is one of them. He's a great man. Actually, he talked about al istiklal al fikri, you know, uh, intellectual independence, and he said that without intellectual independence, al istiklal as siyasi is nothing. You know, uh, and he said, you know, like if you gain istiklal siyasi without istiklal fikri, you know, uh, we will be still uh, culturally colonized, uh, and there will be no benefit of having uh, political. Uh, freedom or emancipation. So he's a great person. Inshallah, keep reading him and translating him to Bengali. That's brilliant. You know, we Turks, we wrote the books. It's now Bengali's job to translate it. You want us to translate also? <laughs> Good question. Good question. Yeah, we could <laughs> there, there's, there's, some, there's some scholars in Bangladesh who are interested in that kind of project. I'm in conversation with them. Like, uh, so inshallah. But also, like you know, uh, scholars living in the West, from the uh, Indian subcontinental diaspora, they're they're very much uh, you know they follow Ottoman scholarship as well. And yeah, inshallah, inshallah. You know, uh, there is a there is a need for networking of yeah, uh, Muslim countries, you know, with each other. So maybe Bengali intellectuals they don't know any Muslim intellectual from Turkey, uh, and also Muslim intellectuals in Turkey they don't know. In intellectual from Bengali, <laughs> you know, uh, so, you know, there is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, isolation and disconnection. Uh, so this kind of translations would help, you know, networking uh, uh, Muslim worlds, you know, uh, so they know uh, intellectuals from other uh, places, other countries and benefit from their works, uh, inshallah. Yeah. Anyone else, uh, any other thoughts, if not, um... I was just thinking, uh, uh, Professor Rajab, uh, I was smiling in my in my head earlier on. Uh, if you're, 
BBC in the UK has a radio program called Radio 4, it's a station, and it has a program called Moral Maze. And I was thinking if we invite, if they only invited you, it would be the cat amongst the pigeons there, because they really struggle with uh, social issues uh, on, a, on a weekly, some of their top intellectuals, both coming from the deontological utilitarian perspective, liberal left to completely sort of conservative perspectives and you could see the fight that goes on between them yeah, for yeah, yeah. issues and uh, it would have been a breath of fresh air if anyone gets a chance online to listen to some radio for it's called moral maze and the, you know the pertinent questions of um, of uh, current society are addressed there and i think most of us we don't need professor shantuk actually to be to i mean i'm shouting over the radio saying oh how stupid is that you know, and I'm, a, I'm an, um, uh, a general public, uh, but they, they struggle because they have no structure on which they can actually reference on it. So uh, yeah, it was just a thought in my head. Maybe I can try and influence someone to invite you there and uh, set this, create a storm in a teapot, as they say. But uh, well, I, I think I thank everybody uh, for uh, joining today's lecture and uh, making very valuable contributions and comments. Um, and uh, as this is the last lecture, uh, I, I thank you all for joining and making this um, and regularly joining actually and making this series a success. And we uh, also thank Usul Academy for being a partner of this series. I'm personally, I'm all sold on Usul Academy, by the way. I'll be joining you very soon, inshallah. Uh, okay. uh, some, uh, uh, and that's my that's my next agenda. That's my next thing after the MedEd I've done. So Usul Academy, here I come. Now, I especially thank Professor Shantuk for delivering such wonderful lectures, mind-opening, soul opening thoughts and lectures actually and answering our questions no matter how difficult or how easy they were uh, and we all have benefited from your lectures I, I thank you from the bottom of our heart uh, that you you have opened this uh, field for us um, and we look forward to seeing you again in the future uh, to another wonderful series I'm, I'm pretty sure the next one will be even better than this one uh, so uh, thank you again for all of you taking part and uh, please keep in touch with us on our Kames WhatsApp group. Uh, if you don't uh, ha uh, have it, you can uh, message one of us if, uh, or we can give you a link. I think we sent a link earlier on for the WhatsApp group. You're welcome to join uh, on that and we'll try and accommodate you uh, into the group so you can keep in tab of what's happening. And uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to bring tonight's session to a close. Uh, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Tashakular, tashakular, professor. Tashakular, tashakular. Okay. Assalamu alaikum, everyone.